from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Let me say, first of all, that Michelle is here uh, with a couple of members of her posse who I have to recognize. Uh, one of them is from the McNeil Mayor News Hour. It's Gwen Eiffel, who's right down here, who's trying to remain anonymous. I do that not only because I love Gwen and respect her work, but because she and my wife also went to Simmons College, and I have to be able to go home tonight. Uh, <laughs> and also, I want to recognize another one of the uh, great reporters at the Washington Post, Ophelia Knight. Now, um, I had the distinct pleasure uh, some 20 years ago of hiring Michelle Norris uh, at the Washington Post. And uh, we interviewed her at a, um, uh, a convention of the National Association of Black Journalists. And the person who uh, was directly responsible for bringing her onto the staff who worked for me uh, has re most recently been the chief speechwriter for uh, Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton, Lisa Muscatine. And uh, when I asked Lisa after she had breakfast with Michelle, so what did you think of her? She said, she's incredibly smart. She's really very good. And when she talks, she sounds like a black Lauren Bacall. <laughs> because she has this deep voice, uh, which of course, those of you who, who knew uh, Catherine Graham, Mrs. Graham also had a deep voice. You know, we say, how are you, Mrs. Graham? I'm fine, how are you? Okay, that'll work. Uh, Catherine Wimbus does not have a deep voice. Uh, that doesn't really matter. You know, the interesting thing uh, about Michelle Norris is that uh, we introduce her in the long shadow of the current headquarters of the National Council of Negro Women. And Michelle, through her work, has really been someone who I'm sure the pioneers in that organization, Mary McLeod Bethune, Dorothy I. Height, would be very, very proud of. Many, many reporters who are really very good come to the Washington Post newsroom. Most of them do not win the Livingston Award for young journalists. Michelle Norris did. Most of them write, <laughs> most of them write a lot of stories that no one really pays too much attention to. Michelle Norris wrote stories that the President of the United States paid attention to and talked about. And the fact that she writes now an American story, American memoirs, her own memoirs, which tells us something about uh, the nation in which we live, the good as well as the bad, is really a tribute to her and to a whole cadre of young writers uh, who are telling us very, very important stories. Some 20 years ago, I had the distinct privilege of introducing uh, a young, promising reporter to the newsroom of the Washington Post. This afternoon, with great pride, I have the privilege of presenting to you an award-winning reporter and an author, Michelle Norris. Thank you, Milton. Boy, you know, when we met all those years ago, we're not going to say really how many. Uh, <laughs> I, I never dreamed that I would be standing here. Um, Milton mentioned a few members of my posse that are in the audience. I have to call out some very important members of my posse that are also at the fringe of the audience over there. My husband, Broderick Johnson. <laughs> Our son, Broderick Johnson, Jr. And the littlest people in my household, Norris Johnson and Asia Johnson, and they're both saying, Mom, why are you doing this right now? And they're with their god mommy, Marcia Jones Ferguson. I'm calling out my family because this is a, this is a family memoir. And in many ways, it's, a, it's an accidental memoir. It's not the book that I set out to write. You see, I thought that there was this interesting conversation going on across the country in the lead up to the election of President Barack Obama and in the wake of his election. And I thought that this conversation was not the one that you were hearing 
necessarily on the evening news. It wasn't the one you were hearing on cable television. It was the conversation that was out of earshot. It was taking place in private spaces. And I wanted to try to chronicle that conversation, to eavesdrop on it, and then to write a series of essays on that. When I began listening to the hidden conversation in my own family, I began hearing profound things. I realized that my parents kept certain things from my generation. There were secrets that they kept to themselves, secrets they locked away because they didn't want to clutter our path forward. They didn't want to saddle us with their pain and their frustration. And at first I thought that these things might be an anecdote in that book that I was planning to write about other people and how other people talk about race. But over time, I couldn't let go of the things that I was learning. The more I learned, the more I had to know. And the more that I knew, the more I had to learn. These stories got up on top of me and they, they wouldn't get off my back. And so I had to pivot. And I wound up writing these ac this accidental memoir. And among the things I learned was that my father was shot by a police officer in 1946 when he was a young man, when he had returned to Birmingham, Alabama after his service in World War II. Now you notice that I paused before I said that because I've written the book, I've told the story, but I will never get used to saying that sentence. My father was shot. Apparently he chose not to say that sentence to anyone. He didn't tell the kids, he didn't even tell my mother. I learned of this only recently, and she learned of this only recently. And if you think of all the conversations, if you're married, you know what I mean. If you're in an intimate relationship, you know what I mean. All the conversations you have in intimate moments, how you think you know everything about a person, and then imagine realizing that something that monumental, that profound, was kept from you. So when I wrote this memoir, I wound up pulling family members along on this journey and they didn't necessarily buy a ticket. Uh, and so we had to lock arms and do this together. My father, when he was a young man, after serving in the military, uh, in a segregated military at that time, returned to Birmingham, as did many black war veterans. Black war veterans were, black World War II veterans were streaming into Birmingham and many other cities and they were wearing the uniform. They had a certain pride after serving in the military. They had greater expectations. They wanted to participate fully in civic life. They wanted to vote. And they faced, in Birmingham and in many other cities, a white wall of resistance. My father was a postal worker. He was a very gentle man. If you met him, one of the first words you would use to describe him would probably be kind, maybe funny, probably calm, uh, he was someone who liked things a certain way. He was always dressed um, in exactly a certain way. When he wore his postal uniform, everything was laid out. When he went out, you could practically cut your finger on the crease of his pants. He took care of his home beautifully. He was very quiet, very reserved. But in 1946, when a police officer tried to stop him from entering a public building, a building he uh, had the right to enter, he did something that was as surprising to me as learning that he was shot. He stood up to that policeman and he paid a price for it. A scuffle ensued. He was shot in the leg. I never knew any of this. My mother never knew any of this. But it turned out she too had a secret. She never talked about something from her past. Her mother, in the late 1950s, in the late 1940s, excuse me, in the early 1950s, had spent years traveling the Midwest, doing pancake demonstrations, dressed up as Aunt Jemima, with a hoop skirt and a headscarf. My mother didn't talk about this because it made her feel a certain degree of shame. Now when I learned of this, I didn't immediately go to that place. I didn't immediately feel shame. I felt a certain amount of fanc fascination and a great deal of surprise because the woman that I remember, the Ion Brown that I remember, was someone who was very elegant, 
She always had pastel dresses or church suits. She was very bossy. And she used that to great effect to control her grandchildren, but also to do some great things in my hometown of Minneapolis. She founded a senior citizen center that still bears her name, and she was always getting awards from the city. And I remember when I was young, she got the key to the city, and she was fussing at Mayor Frazier because something wasn't happening fast enough. That's the kind of woman that she was. She was always dressed to the nines. She would wear, now some of you in the audience may remember the days when women would go out and their shoes matched their handbag. You would never, ever, ever wear brown shoes in a black handbag. I have black shoes and a brown handbag. That would be like a major fashion faux pas at that time. So the shoes matched the handbag and the handbag had a little pair of gloves that kind of peeked out over the side of the purse. And she always had like a silk scarf that would cover her well coiffed hair and she would tie that scarf underneath in very sort of Jackie O style. But when I learned about the work she had done, I had to imagine what it must have been like for her to get dressed up as Aunt Jemima and wear a different kind of scarf. You probably couldn't call it a scarf. Maybe you'd call it a kerchief. Maybe you'd call it a rag. And she'd have to reach up behind her head and put that rag back here and tie it up on top of her head. Now, I don't know what kind of hard bargain she made with herself before she dressed up, before she hiked up that hoop skirt. But I was fortunate in that I found a newspaper, I found some newspaper clippings that described her work. Under the headline, Aunt Jemima's Coming to Town, I saw her picture. And then it became very real for me. And I also saw what she told a reporter at that time, and it was like her speaking to me almost from the grave. And there was no shame in her description. Now again, I don't know what, she, you know what went through her head when she was in front of the mirror, but when she talked to the reporter, she talked about how she used that position to serve as a kind of ambassador. She had a six state region, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, the Dakotas, and Iowa. And when she went to these small towns, she knew that she was facing an audience that didn't see very many people of color. So she spoke a certain way. She carried herself a certain way. She said that she would sing gospel songs because she wanted people in these towns to know that she was a church woman, a church woman, as she probably would say. And she would speak in a way that probably was quite different than the Aunt Jemima that people in those small towns would encounter if they picked up a magazine of the day because Quaker Oats, the company she worked for, was a huge advertiser and they advertised in all the women's magazines. And the Aunt Jemima that you would meet in the women's magazines was someone who wore the headscarf and the hoop skirt, but she spoke in a certain slave patois that was totally made up by advertising men. She, her catchphrase was la, her catchphrase was eyes in town, honey. And she would talk about lazy, my pancakes are temptalizingly delicious. And they would spell this out phonetically so you could see that she didn't exactly use the King's English. Well, apparently when Ione Brown was serving pancakes, she did use something that was a bit closer to the King's English. So Quaker Oats, in that sense, got more than they bargained for. My mother hated this story. She didn't want me to talk about it. And I had to wait her out because once I learned about it, I knew I had to learn more and I knew eventually it would have to be a stop along my journey. And finally she started to give me signals and clues that she was ready to talk about this. And she started telling me not just about grandmother but about her experiences. And there were yet more surprises. My father's from Birmingham, my mother's from Minnesota. She's, her family has lived in Minnesota for several generations. They were, for a time, the only black family in Alexandria, Minnesota. My grand, my great-great-great-grandfather was a barber. When she and my father purchased their home on the south side of Minneapolis, the home that I grew up in, they weren't exactly welcomed by the neighbors. Now, I didn't know any of this. I grew up in a highly integrated neighborhood, took it for granted, this little rainbow community on the south side of Minneapolis, but it wasn't exactly a rainbow community when they moved in. They purchased their home in 1961, year I was born. I guess I shouldn't say that out loud. <laughs> but they were the first black family to purchase a home on that block on the south side of Minneapolis. They were blockbusters. Now in some cases blockbusters were recruited by the NAACP or the Urban League or other civic organizations. In this case, they were recruited by no one. They wanted to live where they wanted to live. They wanted to live near water. It being Minnesota, there's a lot of water and they wanted to be close to it. They wanted to send their kids to certain schools, so they purchased this house. Stucco Tudor House on the south side. And immediately, 
every neighbor whose property line touched ours moved out, or at least tried to move out, because those that didn't move quick enough found that it was awfully hard to sell. I discovered these stories by accident. My parents had been carrying these around for years. But once I finally gave them permission to talk about this, I never had the chance to talk to my father about this. He took his secret to his grave. But once my mother started talking about these things, through her strength and through her wisdom and through her great courage, she started to share stories. And some of them were quite painful. And some of them, frankly, were delightful. And I'd like to share one with you, if you don't mind. My parents moved into their home within a week. And as I said, the white families whose property line touched ours soon put their homes up for sale. Three who owned houses across from my parents also decided to decamp. As my parents celebrated their new home with a picnic supper amid boxes in the living room, their neighbors furiously burned the dial, calling each other, calling my folks' mortgage lender to complain, and eventually calling real estate agents to put their homes up for sale pronto. Mom says she watched the white flight with a mixture of anger and amusement. The desperation of her new neighbors to sell gave her an opportunity for a little mischief. Every time a real estate agent pulled up with a prospective buyer, she would send my older sisters, Marguerite and Cindy, out to play in the yard. <laughs> or she would saunter out herself, holding her back or stretching out her arms. Mm. So anyone could plainly see that another child was on the way. That child was me. My sisters and I never knew any of this until recently, but now mom loves telling the story. I'd wait until they got inside the house and had time to check out the bedrooms and look inside the closets. And right about the moment I thought that they were in the kitchen giving it a real good look-see, I'd say to myself, showtime. <laughs> so I learned a lot of things that made me laugh. Some of them tickled me, but many of them made me cry. Many of them made me curious. Many of them made me think about the country I lived in and what I really didn't know or didn't understand and how I was shaped, not just by all the advice that I got from my parents and the love and the wisdom, but how I might have also been shaped by the weight of silence. All the things that were never said. You see, I'm left with this image of my father and his secret. Uh, of a man who was carrying around a weight all his life, a big, heavy, 50-pound barbell that none of us could see, but he was quite aware of, dragging it around and trying very hard not to let the world know what was behind him. I see that image almost like a shadow next to the man that I remember. And when I went back and tried to understand what Birmingham was like in 1946, I realized that despite the horror of what happened to him, that he was actually lucky. Black veterans were returning to a country that they loved but didn't always love them back. I learned that in the first six months of 1946, excuse me, the first six weeks of 1946, that period in which my father was shot, that half a dozen black veterans were killed by police officers in and around the city of Birmingham. I learned that throughout the year in 1946, black veterans around the country were beaten and burned and maimed and castrated and lynched and blinded, and in some cases killed. In fact, it was the blinding of a veteran named Isaac Woodard three hours after he was honorably discharged that so moved so incensed President Harry Truman that he created a commission that ultimately led to the full integration of the military. I did not know this. I'm ashamed to say I did not know more about this. But what I know now is that my father was part of a generation that experienced horrible things but didn't let that define them. I called my book The Grace of Silence for a reason. And it's not just because they kept silent about what they experienced. I realized that a group of people, a cohort really, that had every reason to be angry at the world, every reason to be disappointed, every reason perhaps to live their life as malcontents, instead chose 
to look back not with anger, at least not look back and held, hold that anger in such a way that it was manifest. They decided to look forward with hope. They decided to show America what they could be, and in doing so, show America what it could be by leading lives of utter, recti utter, utter rectitude. They put their hope and their faith in their children, in my generation, and they chose not to arm us with their rage, but instead to arm us with their ambitions. They wanted us to soar, and if you want your children to soar, you don't send them out into the world with boulders in their pockets. And so that is why I call this book The Grace of Silence. But I hope that you will read it and buy it. That's a line that bears repeating. I hope <laughs> that you will buy it and read it. And I hope that when you do, that perhaps you decide to exercise the grace of silence in a different form. And that is to listen to people in your own lives, to capture your own histories. I mean, the thread that runs through this book is a simple question. How well do we really know the people who raised us? You know, they, they keep things from us not because they're dishonest, but because they want the best for us. They're very careful about what they say. And sometimes when you're actually ready to capture that history, it's too late, they're gone. That's what happened in my case. I had to go through this anthropological exercise to find out what happened to my father. I'm lucky, I'm honored that I had the chance to sit down and talk about my history with my mother and with other elders in my family. So I hope that you will consider practicing a special grace of silence in that sense, but also in another sense, to hear each other out. Because in doing this work, I went back and I tried to understand how life was lived on both sides of the color line. I tried to talk about race and racial attitudes today. And I heard things that made my hair stand on end. I heard people talk about how they hated people of another race, how they weren't ready to have a black family in the White House, how they thought that things might have been better under segregation. I learned things and I heard things that I didn't necessarily agree with, but I listened. And we don't always do that. When someone says something, speaks candidly, if they say something that's in politic, particularly if it involves race, we tend to bark them down. We send them back to their corner. How dare you say that? Sometimes we have to listen. Sometimes you have to go to the table, stay at the table, sit down at the table, and remain there even when someone says something that you don't like, even when someone says something that might make your stomach turn. That is exercising the grace of silence in a different way. And so I hope this book in the end, even though it's called The Grace of Silence, may be the first step on a journey that will lead you as individuals and maybe in some small way us as a nation towards something called a great conversation. And I'm hoping that we can have a bit of a conversation today. I wanted to make sure that we left time for questions and answers. And so if there are any, any questions, I'll try to be as honest as I can in answering them. Thank you. Hi, my name is Miss Martin. Um, I too have found some secrets in my family. My mother and my grandfather told me about something just before they passed away. And most of my family are now gone, and I'm not married with no children. And I found out I have a few family members who've made history, but once I started doing genealogy research recently, and I put it on the back burner for a long time because it's emotional, I now have about seven family members who've made history in some way, and I can go back to 1600 now, my family. Well, good for you. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. So my question is, um, how do you begin to write about your genealogy research. I mean, can you talk a little bit about ghostwriters and publishers and editors and how do you bring this about? Because I understand it can be quite expensive to do. So economically, I mean, how do you get started with something like one this? One sentence maybe? at a time, one word at a time. I mean, I don't know very much about ghostwriters. I know that through self-publishing and through the proliferation of smaller houses, it's become easier to get published as a writer. So. Um, I think that there's probably a lot of information that you can get even here at the National Book Festival, but I can talk to you about writing because I have more experience with that. And a writer writes, and it's one word and one sentence at a time. And 
We often think that writers are those other people. Um, for a long time I did, even though I swim in words all day long, first as a newspaper reporter, then in television, now on the radio. And I, I tell you, when someone gave me a badge today that said author, I almost swooned, because I thought, oh, <laughs> new adjective that applies to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not used to that. But we all have stories, and we can all tell them. And so I just encourage you to write, and if you're intimidated by a blank page, write in a journal. When I did some of the writing I did for this book, I had to find my authentic voice as a writer, so sometimes I would write an email form. I would, tell, I, I would pretend like I was sending, literally, I would call up an email window, and I would pretend like I was sending an email to my husband Broderick, or to my best pal Gwen, or to you know, a family member that I was trying to elicit information from. And I would write an email because I felt free to use bad punctuation and sort of say the things that I would normally say, and then I'd cut and paste and move it into Word, and then make, turn it into English. So you know, whatever you have to do to tap into that voice, but I will say one last thing. A writer does write and a writer writes every day because it's a muscle and the more that you use it, the more that it builds and if you don't use it, it does atrophy. So I empower you to write your story. May the force be with you. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Thank you very much. It was very Thank inspiring. Uh, I want to to ask you a question that involves the craft also. Was The Grace of Silence your working title? How long ago did you start, and how did you get that authentic voice? And I just need to preface this by saying, talk about six degrees of separation. I met Miss Brown by the River Raisin in Monroe, Michigan. Wait, my grandmother, yes. I own Brown? Yes, yes, Aunt Jemima was coming to town. It was my first year of teaching. I had just graduated from Michigan State, and I was their first black teacher, and she spoke the Kings. Wait, you met my grandmother? Yes. That's how old I am. <laughs> Six degrees of separation oh here. Monroe, Michigan, by the River Raisin. Okay? <laughs> if it was your grandmother, that's who I met. Michigan. Oh my goodness. And she spoke the King's English to me, because I'm wondering, why is Aunt Jemima mm -hmm. here in Monroe, Michigan? I was the first black teacher for the city. There was a first black teacher for the county. We both ended up at the Episcopal Church, and they thought it's because they were nice to us, when that just happened to have been our religion. But the point I wanted to make <laughs> is that it was Aunt Jemima talking to me as a person that I got it because I knew she was making a living when she was doing that. And a couple months later, I was asked to play the maid in a school play put on by the Monroe School System. And I said no, because of Aunt Jemima. Because I didn't have to play a maid any longer. Just because she was doing that, it was clear it was a role. And she didn't have any shame about it. She was putting food on the table or whatever for Serving her children. Serving pancakes and making bacon. Yeah, and she did not speak a dialect to me. We had a conversation. So it made my hair stand up on my arm to hear oh my that story. So I definitely will get the book. So my question again was, <laughs> <laughs> what was your working title? Uh, th what's your name? Gloria. OK, don't go away uh, when we're done. OK, <laughs> so OK. You, we need to talk, obviously. Um, the working title initially was Say What? And that was when I was planning to write this other book. And I liked it because it had a double entendre. Um, in, among people of color, Say What? is sort of a term of slang, like, say what? You know, or, or sometimes it's incredulity, say, say what? And then it also was sort of plaintive, you know, for people who were having a hard time figuring out what to say. What do I say? Say what? Say what? I'm walking through eggshells. How do I say anything? Um, but then when the book turned, it didn't seem like the right title. It seemed flippant, too much like a, a game show almost or something. So we, we thought about um, You Don't Say for a time. And actually, I was with my children. We were hiking in a canyon. And uh, we were so far away from civilization, it was silent. And you could hear the wind um, create almost like a certain kind of music. And the title came to me, The Grace of Silence, and that's where we are. How did I find my authentic voice? It was basically just trying to write 
the way I write emails to Gwen all day. <laughs> That's how I told the story. Thank you. Take two more questions. Okay. We can take two more questions. Michelle, I'm very much looking forward to reading your book. Um, my question is, how did your reporting background and skills as a journalist inform your work on this memoir? And then also, what were the memoirs that you found inspiring or useful as a guide in your own writing? Wow, that's a great question. I, um, I had to shift my reporter's hat in working on this because I couldn't stand on the sidelines. I had to get inside the story. I had to begin a lot of sentences with I, which I generally don't do a lot of in my role as a host. I'm a host, not a columnist. But it helped me do a lot of digging. Uh, it helped me do the kind of investigative work that I had to do to, to unpack this story. Um, and I think it helped inform the kind of story I ultimately told in that I tried to understand things from lots of different sides. So I very much wanted to know what life was like for the police officers involved in the shooting, where they lived. And I realized that their lives were a lot similar they were very similar to the lives that my grandparents lived in Birmingham, and maybe if the color, the color line wasn't a hundred miles high and a hundred yards thick, they would have seen that, you know, something of themselves in each other. Um, in terms of memoirs that were uh, inspiring to me, the color of water was um, was something that very much helped me. Um, that the, the the courage that he had in in telling that story. And uh, my mother had, um, had given me, actually, I, I, she didn't give it to me, I, I have it, <laughs> I should say, um, the book Eleanor and Franklin, which is not truly a memoir, but in that book, Eleanor Franklin talks about the letters that she received from service members, and I wound up going back and looking at a lot of those letters. It's not exactly a memoir, but it is a, a way of, of um, telling their own stories, and, and those two things really did have a strong impact on me, the, the letters of the servicemen, black servicemen in particular. Thank you for your question. So you um, spoke a lot about uh, <laughs> burdens that were not uh, given to you. Uh, and so that's kind of like um, the negative space, the, uh, the, the, the white space on the paper. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, what I'm curious about is, is if you can tell us what messages you got, what positive messages you got from your parents and your grandparents that have, uh, that have, uh, that have driven you to where you are? I mean. Well, I, you know, I think I might have been a little bit of a different person if I had known some of what they kept from me, particularly about the Birmingham shooting. I went to Birmingham almost every summer when I was a kid. Birmingham would have been a very different place to me if I had known that it was the place that my dad got shot. Um, and, and so I didn't, you know, I, I, I probably had a more expansive view of the world, and when they would tell me, look for the good in everybody, um, it was easier to do because I didn't know about, you know, some of the, the things that, that they'd locked away. I mean, though they didn't use the words of Gandhi, that was essentially the message they passed on. Be the change that you want to see in the world. They, they taught me to try to be fearless, but at the same time, you know, they also did tell me you might have to work twice as hard to get half as far you might not meet people who are always going to treat you with respect. And they basically said, ignore them. <laughs> because uh, we expect great things of you, and we want you to expect great things of yourself. Thank you. She's been patient for last year. And since you've been patient, <laughs> thank you. One last question. What was the most um, astounding thing you've learned um, in your career, whether it was positive or negative? The most astounding thing that I've that I've learned. Well, I've been oh boy, I've had I've had several periods of great astonishment um, <laughs> over over the past year. So if I had to uh, say which which was the most astounding, I guess I would answer simply by saying I'm astounded every day that people are willing to tell their own story. Um, I tell stories on the radio all the time. I ask people to tell me about themselves or I ask them questions and I'm always somewhat astounded that they answer. Um, and it's a simple thing, but I, I truly am every day astounded that Americans are willing to tell their story. Less astounded though as time goes on because now that we're in the Twitter universe and maybe people are sharing too much, <laughs> like maybe you know there's a few things we don't need to consider. Um, <laughs> 
My parents love your TV show. I mean, your, your radio show. Oh, well, do they make you listen? Are you a prisoner of public radio? Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but I listen sometimes. It's worth listening. If you want to conquer the world, you have to understand it. So, <laughs> thank you. And thank you all for coming. And also, thanks to Jennifer Ramos. And thank you, Milton. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle North. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.